Thanks. So, yeah, I'll be talking about this programming language, Urweb, that I've been developing for about 10 years. It's a domain-specific language for the web. And I'll just start with the uh, project website here. And uh, the important thing is, down at the bottom, you can see Urweb is in the most popular package management system. So if you have an operating system of choice that uh, doesn't happen to be Windows, then you can probably type the package name URWEB into your, your package manager and have this pop up and be ready to run. Uh, this is really going to be a, a demo, though, so uh, there won't be any slides. And I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions during the, the demo. I won't have time to explain all the details of the code I'll be showing, but luckily, because I'm the one driving and I know the details, this uh, is acceptable for the audience not to completely understand what's happening. I will try to go through the, the, the high points. And uh, the basic message here is going to be that we can use the programming language features of Urweb to uh, re remove the repetitive nature of a lot of web programming and write first-class code that stands for recipes the programmers are running manually in their heads. This is a th this kind of code reuse and effort savings is standard in the web, but what's not standard is to apply static types to the code generators so that you know they're always going to give reasonable answers. So that's what I'll be demoing today. And uh, I'll be using this running example of an application. This is an Urweb program that has a, a database of all the talks in Splash Eye with their, their times and their titles and their speakers. And there's a little form at the bottom to add a new entry to this database. I think this is a pretty standard functionality, so I won't even bother submitting the form. But take my word for it, it does the right thing. <laughs> Let's look at the code. So uh, here is the code for this application. And so Urweb is a, a DSL, so it has integrated into it syntax for declaring SQL tables like this one. There's just one table for this, this demo so far called talk. It has a time, a title, and a speaker for ev every talk. Each of these is declared as a string so that we can take uh, our first steps in metaprogramming in a, a simpler setting than if they were different types, but I'll get to that variation eventually. And uh, here's the main function of the application. When you load a certain URL, the semantic says the URL ends in the text main, so it calls this function main, and it does a bunch of things to generate an HTML page. It starts out by running this SQL query, so we can see the syntax of SQL is embedded inside of Urweb. It is parsed and type-checked at compile time. <coughs> so this just gets a sorted list of all the talks. And we're going to store that in what is essentially, it's called a source. It's a, a mutable local variable. So we'll create a local variable with the talks in it. And I'm going to initialize some other variables for the three form fields at the bottom. And they're all storing strings. Uh, two of them start out empty. One gets the current time. And then we'll just generate some HTML code here. And uh, this is also parsed and type checked by Urweb. And we have an HTML table here that has some content that's built by mapping over the value of the talks variable list.mapx is a library function for mapping to produce HTML. And <coughs> you can see here, we then we, we sort of went from Urweb out here to HTML syntax. We escaped in some Urweb code again, then we're back into HTML syntax, and then escape in some Urweb code again to anti-quote in the values of the three fields of this record, which is bound successively to every one of the, the rows that was returned by that query at the beginning. And here are a bunch of text boxes that are bound to particular local variables. So as you type in the text box, the local variable changes also. And finally, an add button that retrieves the values of the local variables, builds a record from them, makes a remote procedure call to the server asking to add that record to the database, and then we update the, the lo our local variable talks by adding the new record to the beginning of the, the, the current value and then sorting by time. And up here I showed the, the add function that is called here. This definition just makes a, an insert operation in SQL. So the, uh, Urweb is a, a purely functional language, sort of like Haskell and OCaml. And it's also a so-called tierless language, where you write your whole web application in one language, and it gets compiled to all the standard languages that are needed to make it run in web browsers. And I'll just compile this here to show that something happens, and something happened, and uh, it's the same thing as before. 
Uh, so uh, any questions about the, the code before I start making it more automatic? Yeah. Signal function has to do with functional reactive programming. I feel like that's about the right answer for this, this setting, but push me further if you'd like more. <laughs> Uh, X stands for XML. It's a map to make a list and then concatenate them all as XML fragments. Special map for producing XML. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, sa it's the same trick as Haskell. There's a monad. Actually, there are two monads here. Uh, Maybe amusing exercise to try to reverse engineer what they must be from the code. <coughs> All right, so uh, before I get into actually making this more automatic, I need to go over some basics. So I'm going to delete most of this content for now, and we'll bring it back later. Uh, I'm going to assume people have basic reading knowledge of Haskell or OCaml or some language like that, and I'll just briefly show how some of that looks here. I'm going to write the classic function for mapping over a list. It has two type parameters, A and B, and it takes in a function that turns an A into a B. And we also take in a list of A's and we return a list of B's. And this does the a absolute standard thing. Empty list goes to empty list. Non-empty list gets the function applied to the first element and then recursively map over the rest of it. So let's return a simple page here that I'm just going to use for outputs of tests of this function, essentially. Uh, let's call list map on the function that adds one to a number, and we'll call it on the one, two, three list. I'm using some syntax here for anti-quoting values of the host language into the HTML, so let's compile this. And we get two, three, four, so, so far so good. Uh, there are more complicated kinds of polymorphism in our web that will be essential for doing a typed version of standard code generators for the web. So I'm going to, here I'll write the test case first. Seems uh, appropriate at Uppsala that I should do that. So I'm going to call a function called sum, which is now not a sum over a list, it's going to be a sum over a record. And just like in Haskell or OCaml, this record has its structure fixed at compile time. And you're, we're not used to being able to iterate over those in a type safe way, but Urweb does make this possible. So I'm going to want this to print six as the answer when I get the function written. And so the way I'll do that is I'll write a function that is has a type parameter with this funny looking annotation, curlies around unit. This essentially means R is a finite set of field names. It'll be exactly the names that appear in the record that we pass in. And uh, here's the record, it has this type, which essentially means uh, take the names in R, build a record where every one of those is associated with a type int. So this now describes all int records, which is what we'll need to make this idea of summing make sense. And then one extra argument I'll put in here, oh by the way, it returns an int. I'm going to need to require that an iterator be passed in. It's an iterator over this finite set, deciding some order and giving us a way to step through the elements of the set in order. And we'll need that for summing. So uh, the, the caller will provide that. And the way this works, uh, here's where the uh, strange invocations start. I'm using a library function that, that it's, a, it's like list fold, but it's, it's more richly typed. It says, I'm going to fold over a record that has an int in every position. And then as in my accumulator, as I go, I'm also making an int. And then I'm going to give the step function, which includes some type level quantification over field names and uh, record contents. I won't explain these in too much detail. A little annotation here that includes an assertion that this name is not used in this record, which happens to be the set of names we've already processed as we step through our iteration. And then we get the current record content, which will be an int, as well as the accumulator, the int that we've built up so far as we go. And then I'll add these together. Say the initial accumulator is zero. Here's the iterator we use to make this all work, and here's the record we're going to iterate over. So uh, with a little luck, this should go through, and oops, uh, I think I need to wait a second, and then we get the answer. OK, so, so far so good. Um, any questions about this version? Yeah. Uh, 
The compiler infers it from type information. You can write your own if you're not happy with what inference does. Okay, so this is a little uh, disappointing because it's hard-coded to int. We might want to sum up other types, so I'll just quickly show you how we can do that. I'll write a test case first. Um, let's say we want to, uh, this name will maybe make more sense in a moment. We're going to add up some float numbers instead, and I'll call it function tc sum because it's based on type classes, uh, just like in Haskell. Let's take out a type parameter t. This is going to be the sort of thing that's in the record fields, and what do we know about it? It's a number type. So it supports addition. It has a zero constant. And the rest will stay pretty much the same, except I'll just take all these ints and turn them into t's. And instead of the numeral zero, I'll write the type class member zero. And now we should get a different answer here. And so on. So, and so the user can define new kinds of numbers, like complex numbers or other crazy things. And this function will work for those too. All right, so this is the basic primer on the features I'll be using, uh, quantifying at the type level over information on record types and letting us iterate over them. Yeah. What? Uh, so I left the sum function intact. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's the same kind of overloading as in Haskell, which is pretty magic, but it's old magic. All right, so I'm going to bring back my original program, and we'll start applying these ideas to uh, automated code generation for the web. So I'll just delete this, open the starting point, and start it here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this, almost all this code, and make it generic. And uh, first symbolic step is to move the table name to the end. So now this code doesn't even know this table exists, but let's make it work anyway by enclosing it in an abstraction. I'm um, using this concept of functors from ML module systems. You'll see this in OCaml and many related languages. We're going to write a function that takes in a module and produces a new module that's typed in terms of the contents of the old module, potentially. So I won't use that feature here. And so this module has some input signature and some output signature and then some some contents here. So I'm going to also indent everything by four spaces to indicate uh, how very abstracted this all is. Oops, let's do this right. I want to say that. Okay, uh, and so what are the inputs to this process? We're we need to describe our application-specific data, and in, then we'll be given application-specific functionality automatically. So what do we need to say? We need to say, what are the fields of a table? So uh, I declare this, con is for constructor, which is a generalization of type, some sort of compile time configuration. So we have some set of fields and then a table that uh, uses the same notation as before. We're going to map over the fields. Instead of saying each one is an int, now we'll say every field is a string. Which fields are they? They're exactly the ones in this set. And I also need a, an iterator, which is called a folder in Urweb parlance. So uh, we need an iterator over those fields. And I also am going to want to put some text on the screen that says what the fields are. So I'll ask for another record that assigns a textual name to every field. And what comes out? In the end, we're going to produce a main function, which is a takes no arguments and runs a transaction in the database and produces a page. All right, so now I'm going to I'm going to comment out most of these pieces for now, and I'll gradually add them back as they become generic enough to work in this new setting. So what do I need to get rid of? I'll start out with, uh, I'll hide this button, or I'll just comment out the on-click handler. Okay, so first thing we need to do, this is the first step will be easy. Uh, we could continue to make this database query and force sorting of the results, but it'll be easier for me to leave that off. Turns out the default order is fine. And instead of talk, uh, what did I call this? Table is now called tab. So I'll put tab in here. And here's our first step. This, this query is now type checked independently of <coughs> what table you use in the end. We can guarantee this code will work correctly for any table. It's not so surprising. You can get all the rows of any table. And uh, so these first three lines are now completely generic in the, the schema, subject to our constraint that all the columns are strings. 
Now I need to change this code here, which originally created three text boxes, one for each column of the table. Now it needs to adapt to however many columns there actually are. Uh, but actually, I'll leave that for later. And let's just display the contents of the table for now. So the way I'll do that, oh, and also I should comment out these text boxes because they won't exist anymore. OK, so first thing we notice is we have this header row here that gives the names of the three columns of the table. Uh, hide that, we'll unedit. I'm going to make this generic using the field labels that was passed in. It's a record with one string for every column of the table that gives us the text to use to describe this, uh, this column to the user. And the way this is going to work is I'm going to use another helpful library function uh, called <coughs> map UX. I'm going to map over a record of strings, and then I'm going to produce HTML that fits inside a tr tag. Well, then I better make one, otherwise the type checker would complain. And here's the step function of, of this, uh, this map process. It has a bunch of type level arguments, same as we saw before. And it takes in the string that we're currently iterating over, and then it needs to produce some XML. And in this case, it's just going to be uh, a table header element that has exactly the text that we just ran, read out of the, the record of labels that we're iterating over. So here's the iterator we'll use to do it. This came in as an input to this, this functor. And here's the record of labels that we should iterate over. So now this should be a good replacement for the first line. Let's see if the compiler likes it doesn't know where tab came from because I forgot to import the input module. And now I forgot to define main, which seems to be saying. I'm doing something silly here. Oh yeah, I actually didn't create, I forgot to actually invoke my, uh, my new generic thing on my specific data so that my application actually exists. This is basically just telling me there is no main function. So I can make that go away by just uh, calling my module and say, which table do you want? Well, it's the talk table. Uh, tell me what labels you should include. I want time to be called time. Uh, there will be no surprises here. Title should be called title. Speaker should be called speaker. And now we get back to where we were before, except I commented out a lot of the stuff, but we see the, the heading line here uh, recreated in this generic way. Right, so uh, here's the code that did it. Uh, before I start filling in any other blanks, uh, are there questions about this part of it? Yes. You mean this dollar sign. Uh, that's the operator for a record type whose schema you describe with code instead of just giving a literal schema. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do, uh, we, we this code already ran the query, but we haven't used the results. So let's put it in a generic way of showing the results to replace what was going on here in a less generic manner. We still want to map over all the results, but now instead of Hard coding in, there are three table data tags. I'm going to put in the generic way of doing that. And it'll look pretty similar to this. I actually, I think I can use the same code. So I'll put that in this position. Uh, try to fix up some of the structure. Still need a TR tag. And then here's what goes on the inside. I'm going to map over. Exactly the same thing, except we use TD tags, and I'll map over the record R, which was what we're the the loop variable instead of the labels record. And now we have all of our talks back in here. So we're almost done, and uh, all that's left is I need to deal with these text boxes down at the bottom that can be used to actually make a change to the database. And the way I'll do that is, so here's the old code. I'm going to put in a another invocation that will create, will initialize everything in a generic way. 
And I can do that by, I'll just create one record of sources instead of a separate uh, a separate line of code for each one. I use a function called monad mapr0, which is going to run an effectful function once for, for every element of a record schema. And in every case, we'll produce a source that holds a string. And the way to do that is pretty boring. Uh, we have to quantify over some arguments at the type level, and then we allocate a new data source. And we use this iterator to do it. So now we have a sources, which is a record with, with one field per element of our, our table schema. Every field stores a mutable string. That's what source string means. And then I can put that in here by doing a little more iteration that looks a lot like what we already did. What I'll do is I'll use now an operation called map UX2 that lets me map over two records in parallel when they are based on the same set of names. One record will give the label, that's the string. The other record will give the mutable data sources. That's the one we just allocated up there. And by the way, this should be HTML that's legal to put inside a table. And so same kind of parameters here. And we get in a label. And we get in a data source. And we can just do what this code does. Instead of that constant text, I'll put in the label we found. And instead of this source, I'll put in the source we found. And we need to say, here's the iterator. Here are the labels. Here are the sources. All right, so now our text boxes are back. And the last step is to actually uh, genericize this code that lets us add an element. And the way this will work is now, instead of having these se separate three get lines, I'll do one iteration that does all the gets at once with monad.mapr over a record that contains just source strings. And as a result, I'll produce one string for each of those. So I'm going to take, I'm going to map over all the fields. Where each one starts out holding a data source, and I'm going to replace it with just the value of that data source, which is all we need here. And the way this works is in comes the source. And I'm just going to get its value. And here's the iterator, and here are the sources. And the rest is pretty much the same. Uh, I'm just going to put in, I'll call a function called compare here instead of using a built-in ordering. This is going to compare using uh, lexicographic order with, with the columns considered in the order that they appear in the source code. And to save some time, I, I've written that in advance. And I'll just copy it in here. This is now a generic comparison function for the particular record type that's, that's used in this invocation. And I also will do the same thing for the add function, which does a little bit of similar iteration to produce the SQL query uh, programmatically. And now we should be back to the functionality we started with, where we can add a new talk in here. I think maybe we should give someone else a chance to talk after Guy Steele, who gets the last word. And the speaker is somewhat there we go. All right, so this is our first generic version of this, this functionality. It works for any table that only has string columns. And uh, I'll next show how to make it more general so it handles other types of columns as well. But are there any questions on this before I go there? OK, so I'm going to start in the next case with some some pre-written code, demo three. So to enable all this to be extended to handle columns of different types, I'm going to use a type class to explain for each type which UI widget should be used to accept input about that type. And I won't explain all the syntax here, but uh, th this code is declaring a type class called widget, which explains uh, how to handle a, a different type. and there are a few different operations that are generic in this type class. You can create a new widget. You can render the widget. You can render the data associated with the widget. And you can grab from the widget the current data value. And I have a few type class instances in here that say, well, I know, what's I know which UI to use with a string. 
I know which i to use with an integer. I know which UI to use with a time. So uh, in the code below, these will all automatically be consulted based on the types of data that we're using. And I won't go into the implementation of that, that uh, widget type class. And now here is the updated version of this automatic editor generator. It's still parameterized over fields. The, the type of the, the field value has changed a little bit. It's now a uh, finite map from field names to pairs of types. The first type in the pair tells you the underlying data type. The second type tells you which the type of the widget that will be associated with it. And so now we reconstruct the table schema by mapping with the first projection over this record of pairs. And we still have an iterator. We still have the labels. We now have a record of widgets. And also, these last three parts say that all of the fields belong to appropriate type classes. In particular, all the, the types we use for fields support equality tests. They support ordering comparison. And they're all legal to inject into SQL code as literals. Given all that fancy stuff, we get back the same type as before, but now it's going to work for a broader class of tables. And I won't go into detail on how this, this code down here works, but it is very close to before. And in fact, the invocation down at the bottom is exactly the same code as before. All of those details of these fancy new parameters are inferred automatically uh, in the tradition of type classes. So th I'm using features here to automatically infer records of type class instances whereas Haskell only infers single type class instances. And I also changed the time field to properly have the time type, and whereas before it was string. And still all this properly adapts, so let's check this is true. OK, we should just be back where we started. Uh, same functionality as before. Uh, right, A any questions about, about this before I start showing? some of the, the cool things we can do by defining our own type class instances. Yeah. Uh, when the type of the parameter includes a type class name in the right position, then it tries to infer it. Uh, it it only descends through records, not algebraic data types. So I guess you can imagine an extension that does what you suggested. All right, so I'm going to change the data schema a little bit and show how we don't have to modify the UI generation at all. And the way I'm going to do this, well, first, uh, I'm going to make an addition inside widget. I'm going to add a new kind of UI widget. This is a drop down to select some key from a particular database table. And it says it's a widget that produces a string, and it has this particular abstract type of state, and it's parameterized over an SQL table that has a particular key of string type. So um, I will use this shortly. And the actual application is simpler than the general definition. I won't dwell on how it's defined either. Uh, the cool thing is how we're going to use it. So I'm, I've added a new kind of widget. I haven't changed the editor functionality at all. It's going to keep working and pick up the new type class. And uh, it would probably be, be nice to actually have a table that has information about the speakers, much like the, the website for, uh, for Splash Eye has. So uh, let's add that in here. I'm actually going to put speaker information inside its own module of people. And one interesting thing about about Urweb is it lets you declare tables inside of modules and consider them as fields of those modules. And they can be public or private. And if they're private, then no one else can access them, just like for a, a field in Java. And so I'll consider that it's the uh, attendees table is actually inside this module. Each attendee is a person. A person uh, belongs to some abstract type. Uh, spoiler alert, it's actually going to be string, but the type system is going to hide that from most of the code. So you have to act work with people only through the public methods of this, <coughs> this class, essentially. So each person has an identifier and an affiliation. We'll reveal if that affiliations are strings. And let's remember that it's actually legal to compare people with equality. It's legal to uh, compare them for ordering. And we can also inject them into the database, which sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> and we can create a widget type for people. 
and it's going to be a widget that will produce a person and it does so using this widget. And then the actual implementation of this module is simple. We well actually, I'll just copy this line and inside the scope of this module, which is hidden from the outside world, I'll reveal a person is actually a string and I'll decide what kind of widget do I want for one of this T type. It'll be a foreign key widget that says when you want to enter a person, you choose from a drop down of which people actually exist. And uh, which field do we look up to find the list of people? It's the person column, this one right here. And which table do we look in? It's the attendees table. And that's it. All these other fields get inferred automatically by the type class machinery. And now I can say a, s a person of the here, instead of a string, is a person.t. And then let's see what changes in the code that's generated. Give it a second. And then now the speaker field gets a drop down that's populated from this table of people, which I set up ahead of time. Right. So. The key message here is that this editor functionality is generic. It uses type classes to be prepared for all sorts of different types that might be used in your schema and use a, an extensible mapping from types to their proper handling in the UI. And the editor is type checked statically, so we know once and for all that it's go always going to give reasonable code. Uh, the code that comes out can never have code injection vulnerabilities. It can never have links that don't actually go anywhere. All this is guaranteed by one static type check, but at the same time, it's very adaptable. It plays well with extensions that the programmer wants for, for new kinds of data. Any questions about this code? Yeah. Uh, okay, so creates a, a binary to run on the server for the application. And that binary sometimes returns pages of HTML with JavaScript inside that was compiled from Ur web code. For instance, this onClick attribute is sent to the client with JavaScript in this position instead of Ur web code. And this RPC indicates a, a control flow switch from client to server by making an HTTP request. And similarly, the SQL queries are pretty obviously calling the database. Those are the main tier switches. Y right. You're, you're in parallel running the server and client add new row operations as an optimization to avoid needing to get the server to send you back the whole list of, of speakers or something. Is there another question over there? Yeah. Sorting happens on the client, yeah. Yeah. If the server fails, it, uh, if the server fails, then uh, it's, it's not the ideal UI experience. Let me simulate. I'm going to simulate this by killing the server, and we can see what happens. Uh, let me at least put in some valid data so you would think it would work. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it didn't go on and add the, the talk to the list because an exception aborted that control flow path. If the server comes back up and I click again, everything would keep working. very explicit. You can see uh, in this window, there's a keyword RPC that says control transfer. It, it never surprises you. Yeah. You The server is only accessed via explicit RPCs, so you look at all the functions that are called with RPC and you think about them as an independent API that uh, you can design without even knowing what the UI is. It's, it's think of it like a, the API that a website exposes for other clients to work with it, and you just think, 
the following operations are provided, like this add operation here, and what are their security consequences, where should they use access control, and you put it in there. But the server itself should be able to only release the data that the client should be allowed to see. And you should be resilient to arbitrary mistakes in the UI itself. At least that's the philosophy I follow. But it's all in one, one programming language. But I mean, so concretely, we if we wanted an access control model, in this add function, we'd add an access check at the beginning, and we'd abort if the check failed. Yes. Uh, yeah, you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a long conversation. I think th I think this is the better abstraction approach that uh, that supports more code reuse, but I can't justify that on the spot. Yeah. There isn't much. Uh, this is uh, all it is. The, the the database schema is already in the program, so you shouldn't have to write that again. So that all just works. It uh, it checks at runtime whether the database schema matches the one in your program. Uh, error message on the console. <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, maybe you're talking about the text that I put in this field. I think this is parsed on the client. Okay, uh, so uh, William's last example matches well with my last example. I'm going to show you my course management system, uh, which does includes what his does and uh, other things. And it's built automatically with metaprogramming. So uh, this is just meant to be, uh, I'm going to move out of tutorial mode to a quick glance at the state of the art production quality system mode. Uh, so let me go to the course management app for my my class that I uh, do every year. And uh, well, about a thousand lines of code in here. Uh, let me just show you the functionality first. This is the page that a student in the class would, would access directly. It shows them, uh, this is for a theorem improving class, it shows them the schedule of the class uh, and all the homeworks need, they need to turn in, uh, when things are happening. Uh, presumably, if I were a real student in the class instead of the instructor, there would actually be some check marks in the done columns that would have done some of the homework. Uh, that's all set up automatically. And uh, there's a calendar view of this stuff where we see all the things that are happening, when, when uh, due dates are, holidays, and so on. There's a news system where I post information that shows up here and gets emailed to everybody. Uh, interestingly, every lecture has its own message forum that has a, sp a schema customized to the idea that forums are lectures and you can, I guess no one liked that lecture enough to comment about it. And uh, every assignment also has its own forum. So generic code is used to make a forum for lectures, a forum for assignments where the, the key of, of a forum is actually just the key of the, the lecture table or the assignment table. And I can check my grades. I since I'm not actually a student, I don't have any interesting grades to put in here, but there's a generic mechanism for grading where you declaratively describe the gra grading structure and this gets built for you. And uh, yeah, those are the most interesting parts of this interface. There's other stuff that only the instructor sees, which is interesting too, but for time reasons, I won't go into that. So how does this code look? The idea is uh, th there are, are almost no loops or recursion or even SQL code or HTML in this. It's instantiating generic components for ideas like forum and news and calendar with your data schema. And so we have a bunch of tables, like here's the lecture table. Every lecture has a number and a title, and when does it happen, and how do you describe it? And uh, similarly for assignments, office hours. Who's having office hours? When are they? And then uh, I'll just find look at one of these examples here. Um, something interesting that schema 
dependent. For instance, let's make a calendar. Uh, I'll find one of the lower ones. That one's too complicated. Uh, office hours calendar. So here's an instantiating the general calendar functionality for the idea of office hours. It's a, a component, much like the one we were just developing, but it has more fields. So we have to tell it, uh, what should we call this kind of calendar entry? Let's call it office hours. Uh, which table is the data source for this kind of entry? It's the office hours table. Uh, which, wh which field of that table is the, 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 the key that we should associate with uh, the calendar entry. So each one has a unique value of that key. It's the user. This was one of the columns I entered before. Uh, this field might have multiple columns that include times. Please tell me which of those you'd like to use to generate entries in the calendar. There's just one called when here, but for instance assignments have release date and due date. Th then I'd have two entries in this list and then each one would create a different calendar entry from the same row of the table. We have a some text just for human display purposes, overall title, uh, title for every one of the columns we're using. For every different time, we can give some extra explanation of it, not needed here because there's just one. I'm not giving any extra display code here. Uh, there's Here's an example of access control. This is a function that uh, returns a Boolean saying whether the current user is actually allowed to read or write this. Ac so it's not a Boolean, it's a structured value with more information and a few other stuff. Uh, here we are saying which UI widgets should be used for each of the fields, and I'm saying the, the user should actually be handled with a drop-down box in the style from the last example, saying uh, populate a drop-down box with the results of this query, select the names of all the users who are instructors or TAs, uh, because we're uh, not forward-thinking enough to allow the students in the class to hold office hours, but uh, if we were, we could easily change this query. and then that produces this module office hours calendar which gets composed together with the modules for all these other uh, kinds of, of calendar things the uh, I think this is the schedule of holidays at my university and there are also entries for assignments and lectures and then what do we do with public cal uh, we compose it together with some constant text and produce a first class UI by projecting the UI element out of it. So we create this Cal UI and then Cal UI gets dropped into this bigger description of all the tabs on this page. And uh, there's even a rule here that says only show the calendar if we progress far enough in the semester that we're it's time to release the calendar. There's a state machine for the, the course that controls this. And now we get this nice functionality like I decided uh, my TA is not holding enough office hours so I'll volunteer him for something on this time office hours, uh, yeah, midnight sounds good, and uh, there we have it. And if, a, if another user was viewing the same calendar when I made this change, this, would, this new entry would pop up instantly on the oth other user's calendar, but I didn't have to do any of the plumbing work for that in my application-specific code. It's all encapsulated in the library and comes to life generically for whichever schema you choose. Okay, so I think I'm just in take last questions mode now. Yeah, so it's really easy if you add new tables, but if, if you uh, change the schemas of the tables, then I'd for now I'd just write alter table commands manually. Sure, so let me bring that function back. Uh, so that's how it works. <laughs> uh, this is all code that builds the syntax tree of an SQL insert command. And it, it does so by iterating over the, c the columns of the table and building different code for each and splicing them all together. Insert is, uh, it is, it's just a different type signature for it. Uh, it's, it's built into Urweb, in it's exposed in the standard library. It takes the table name and a record of 
one SQL expression for each column. And that's what this is building. Yeah. External data source. You can do that with the find function interface. There's nothing built in specifically for that case. Well, I sort of did. This, this, this is two tables with a foreign key relationship. So I, d I didn't tell the language about that, but I could do that, and then it would be checked appropriately. I think uh, yeah, it wouldn't quite work. I didn't declare the types right, but I, c I could write a foreign key constraint here if I wrote a primary key constraint up there. Yeah, just like an ML. So uh, not really. It's just um, fancily typed. 